we'll take a look at some of the other stuff that we're still exploring. And to, to call these you know, results may be stretching things a bit far. So let's talk a bit about occupancy. Now, uh, finding out when people are home is a little bit tricky. They don't often want to tell you. But we did have some luck using the American Time Use Survey which has a single individual within the household and uh, they do uh, retrospectively yesterday what they were doing and when they were home. I took a subset of these which is only single person households which there are about 3,000 in the uh, survey and took a look at when they were actually home. Uh, the graphic you're looking at here is actually a subset of 300 of them if I'm not mistaken. When you see gray areas there that means that the people actually didn't report any kinds of behavior. Um, red is an indication that at that hour the people are home. Blue is an indication that they are not proved to be home. Now there is some censoring that goes on in this data. So if anyone was sleeping, if anyone was doing personal grooming or some other kinds of extremely personal activity, which commonly ends up being sex, they don't report where they were nor do they report who they were with. And so if you're looking at a bunch of blue there in the early morning hours, um, people are not listed as being home when they are sleeping, amongst other things, or showering or anything like that. And so this is only the fraction of time within that hour that people are proved home. They could in fact be home, but the data is effectively censored in that case. <clears throat> now you can stick you know, some basic occupancy data within Energy Plus, and the big result that you get is that there's no result because occupancy is really not connected to all sorts of other schedules. Um, it essentially treats people like a light bulb, but it's not connected with things like window opening and closing. It's not connected with lights opening and closing. Those schedules have to be harmonized in a rather sophisticated way. Um, so even though it may have nobody there, it's still possible to have the lights being turned on and off, even though nobody is home. It's still possible to have the windows open and close even though nobody is home. And I think, you know, the, the one of the points here is that there are limitations in the use of this particular tool, Energy Plus. It's a very sophisticated um, building simulation model um, produced um, primarily and initially for uh, the design of new buildings and, and mostly large buildings, commercial buildings. Um, but when we try to occupy these buildings, with people and, uh, I, and try to determine what the effects of their different kinds of behaviors may in fact be or their organized use of the, of the space and the tool doesn't lend itself readily to that use. With that said, there are, are several other researchers who are attempting to move in this direction um, very recently um, and trying to explore the limitations of the tools and, and work on ways that um, schedules for different kinds of end use um, uses, lighting, appliances, plug loads, and so on and so forth can be um, related to the activity of the occupants of the buildings. It, what I would also like to think about here is, is that this points out that although the language is, you know, it's functionally possible to do all these things within the Energy Plus language, it's simply something that's not easy to do. And it points out a need for something which is like a macro language or a template language that you can use to specify behaviors and then it translates it into something which Energy Plus can understand at its base level. Um, it's the kind of way of thinking about a high level language specifies the underlying binary without you having to actually program the underlying binary of the program. It's a, an, an abstraction which is necessary in order to easily get results out. And there's work like this going on and for commercial buildings, we believe that there's a lot of, uh, there's an emerging interest in modeling occupancy behavior, and particularly, for example, for how to say, adaptive comfort. Well, and, and again, when you start to go, well, let's have the next slide so we can finish this up, I think, because what we're starting to show here um, is in the case of things like window opening and closing, while these mm -hmm. things can be accomplished in the context of the model, um, it's a challenge to do. And in fact, because of sophistication in the model, um, new modules have been added, um, say in airflow calculations, that um, create constraints and, for example, don't allow people to open windows under conditions under which it would not be the smart thing to do, right? When it might be warmer outside than inside and so on and so forth. This limits the ability of the tool to explore uh, easily 
um, those kind of effects. Um, and so, in the last slide then, these people from doing stupid things that they actually do do. Um, and this does become more relevant in the case of building design where, as Mitra suggests, occupancy is coming to be seen as more important. Zero energy building design may in fact be one of these cases. Um, you know, what kind of user is required to occupy a zero energy building? Does it matter what they do? Um, if we can see uh, here from something on cooling thermostat settings, it could make a huge difference. Um, how do we deal with that? Do we constrain what people are able to do with thermostats? Mm -hmm. <laughs> do we expect certain kind of behavior? Do we have to train certain kind of behavior? So uh, the, the tool itself also not only limits researchers' ability to explore these issues, research behavioral researchers like us, but it also limits um, the ability of designers to explore the kinds of effects of people on the buildings that they're designing. And I think with regards to things like zero energy buildings, if you're dealing with residences, it could be something like you start making probability statements. So with any household that you put in here, given the range of behaviors that we see, there's a 40% you know, chance of this being a zero energy building. But with your kind of classic behaviors that your particular household does, there's a 40% chance this is a zero energy building. And so probability statements start making more sense when you have this kind of uncertainty. It's not that it is or it is not. There's just a certain chance that it's a zero energy building. So that's the end of the presentation, and we'd like to uh, like to have your thoughts and reactions and advice and uh, help us uh, determine where to go from here. Thank you very much.